All right. Welcome back. This is a special episode. I'm actually going to interview Mr. Zuber. Uh, so the, the cards are turned a little bit and I actually prepared some questions. I want to dive in and uh, make you a little bit uncomfortable, maybe. <laughs> I uh, I look forward to this. No, nothing is off limits. Uh, you know, worst thing that will happen is the, I'll, 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 I'll say something like I'll tell you in private, but, you know, let, let's see where this goes. <laughs> Remember, no editing. OK, so yeah, no editing, no, no editing. All right. So you were about 45 and you stepped away from the corporate world. Mm -hmm. At that time, you had a portfolio of 100 and what, 20, 40 units, 80, 80 units? 180, yeah. 180. And today, what do you have roughly? I think we're down to like 170, I think. I think we, we sold off a couple of things, yeah. Okay, what's your what's your plan over the next couple of years, like with the portfolio? Are you trying to That's a 1031 good exchange? Or, I mean, you, even though you do, even though you're pretty passive, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. still, st so there's st still pain points owning a portfolio of that size. So I'm wondering sure. what your plans are. So I, I have a couple of plans and thankfully uh, I don't self-manage. So I, I have more time to kind of play both of these out. So step one is, uh, as you know, I'm seriously looking at creating a new buy box in, you know, Las Vegas, Henderson, you know, Air Summerlin area. Uh, I really haven't started that in earnest. Hopefully we'll start that after our event this weekend as it's been all encompassing. So what I will plan to do there is I have enough capital uh, to put buy one or two. I also have the option, because again, I could 1031 out of something in California to Vegas. One of the things I'm looking to do there is I want to go newer, right? Something we've like, the, if I were to estimate the average age of our single family homes in Fresno, I would have to guess it's like average would be like 50 years old. Right. We have some that are over 100 and we have some that are 20 or less, but the average is probably 50. So I would like to uh, potentially get out of older stuff into newer stuff. I will probably upgrade. A lot of my stuff is C upgraded, C plus, B minus stuff. Uh, I will likely upgrade, right? Because I'll have, I have huge equity. Let's just use round numbers. Let's say I have equity of a couple hundred grand. And I step into something in uh, Vegas for 400. 400 in Vegas, dude, that could be a new home. It could be it, it could be lots of things. But I'll come in in LTV of you know 50%. Uh, it, again, it'll be about getting out of older stuff to newer, nicer stuff. That's one thing. That will likely happen. But I've been playing for something bigger than that. Really since 2019. I pre-pandemic, I mean, this is important. People can go back and listen on my show. Uh, I've been playing the game of, I wanted to do exactly what we did in my book, One Rinse Line at a Time. I want to sell houses when they are up in value. And I wanted 1031 into multifamily when it is distressed. Little did I know it would take four or five years to get here. Because uh, I saw it coming in 2019. Rates were going up. Uh, it was becoming, you know, more of a problem. But then the pandemic, low rates, zero, you know, zero, everything got delayed. I think that's really coming. I uh, I look forward to the opportunity to 1031 out of houses into small multis, small multis being up to 40 units. That will likely occur in Fresno because that's where I have the infrastructure, the team, uh, I wouldn't buy a 40 unit in Vegas, for example. I don't I don't want to do that again. But I'll buy a house. I'll probably buy up to four because you always hear me talk about four in Vegas. But I, I'm not going to buy huge multifamily in Vegas. I, if I do, it will be with the team I have in place and the systems and processes. But yeah, so I'm running two dual tracks. As I sit here in February, I will likely execute both at different rates. So what does that look like at the end? Uh, if you fast forward to like 2026, we are probably 1031 out of 10 houses. Hopefully the same ratio, because last time we went from 8 to 80. Hope So this time we'll be 10 to 100. Our portfolio will probably be 250 plus, And we'll probably have two to four houses in Vegas. So 250 Central Valley, California, and, you know, two to four in, you know, Vegas in general. That's, that's what I'm trying to do over the next... I don't know, 36 months. 
So, you, I mean, you guys grew up obviously a very impressive portfolio considering, you you know, you borrowed private money, but you, you didn't bring on joint venture partners. Mm -hmm. So early, early on, uh, both you and Olivia were, were probably pretty high paid W2 jobs to get to where you're at. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wasn't making a couple hundred grand a year and they're, you know, they're, they're an 80 or hundred thousand dollar a year person, it's going to be a little bit harder to get the results you did because you guys were pretty well paid W2s, right? Yeah, we, we were both paid six figures. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But again, th this is this is important. And I, sometimes timing just works out. I actually bought this game, cash flow game, again. I have it in Mountain View. I bought it for the Vegas house because I want people to realize there's a couple of things in this game. It, and I'm serious. On my website, onerentalatatime.com, I, I have a tab that says, these made me rich. This game is one of them, right? You can go see all the things that made me rich, and that's one of the games. But where I'm going with this is I can I can predict the winner of that game nine out of ten times by the job that you select, which is one of the first things you do in the game. You, you take these cards, you blindly pick a career. Why am I saying this to you? Because in the game, the high-paid people in that game are doctors and lawyers. The low-paid people in that game are police officers and teachers. I will beat a doctor and a lawyer if I'm a teacher or a police officer nine out of 10 times. Because the goal isn't to be what Olivia and Michael did, 180 units. It, it takes a lot to get out of two six-figure incomes. But you don't need that much if you make 80 grand a year. And what people do, like, that's why I really, Bo, I really talk about getting to four and getting to 10. I think for most people, Dion is the right way to go. Find the minimum number of units you need to two, three, four X your monthly nut and make that the goal. The goal should not, like if I had to do this again, Bo, I don't think I would try to get to 180. I just did it because I was executing head down, just moving forward. I, I didn't even know I had 180 until one year we did a tax audit. I'm like, oh my God, where did all this stuff come from? So um, yeah, you're, you're right. It does take a lot if you have, two six figure incomes but i think it's yeah. easier if you have 60 or 80k income that's a that's a really good perspective that i didn't think about and i think that we need to think about because oftentimes we're comparing ourselves to the you know everybody yeah. on social media going oh i need 180 units because no. you know he's falling no really we need yeah. we need six seven eight units exactly. and you're gonna two so when you retired at say 45 at that point did you have two X cash flow of your salary? Or, yeah, that's another you... that, that's another very good question. Because you hear Dion talk about with his 16 units, he was four X. Olivia and I, I actually went back and did the math. We were somewhere between two and a half and three X. Right. We were not Dion's four X. But again, our numbers were just much, much bigger. Uh so the spread was was pretty wide. But yeah, we we were uh we were safely in the in the two and a half to three X zone. That's when we retired. We're now at four X or whatever because of inflation and mortgage pay down. And we took advantage of low rates. So we, we've taken the time to lower our debt. And obviously we've had inflation and rent. So again, just by holding these last, what would it be five or six years? Now it's four X. And so um, yeah. So when you were going hard and you had the W2 going and you're buying, 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 you know, renovating, mm -hmm borrowing private money. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious on how you lived, like from a financial standpoint, I, I get the impression that you're pretty frugal. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering, like, if I were to ask you, and I'm not going to be get personal and say, what is your total monthly nut every month with with food, mm -hmm. fun and pleasure? Yeah. You probably know that number, I would say. Oh, I would. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've done the math and we knew the number back then. And we know the number now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you would say that's a very important thing for anybody out there to like know what they're spending, right? Like, cause I think a lot of us don't pay attention and we're like, well, what am I actually spending a month on marketing or whatever we're doing in our business or, yeah. you know, personal life? I think that's a, 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 a thing that it's, we overlook. It's so important, Bo. Uh, I did uh, in my daily financial news today, this is just very cool timing. I talked about four steps to getting rich or going from broke to rich. And step one, no lie, you can go back, you can go listen to it, was you had to audit your expenses. We took the last 90 days of our expenses and we did something called a need versus want analysis. And it was uncomfortable. 
because we didn't always agree what a need or a want was. And uh, for about, for over a decade, we didn't really do any wants. All needs were covered. Our daughter got some wants, sure. But Olivia and I, we we didn't get any. We had no joy for a decade. And I think people misunderstand that, right? A lot of people see what we have now. And they're like, hey, we want some of that. But you're not willing to pay the price. For a decade, we didn't get any wants. Zero. And our income went up. Our net worth went up. Every piece of dry powder we had went back into the business for a decade. People made fun of us. We had old cars. We didn't upgrade our condo. It was the same stupid white tile subways that you get at the base model. Nothing. We got nothing for a decade. And I don't I don't think people understand that. But yeah, you need st- versus want st- analysis. You still live in that same condo, don't you? I mean, in California. Yeah. Now you have, now you have yeah. a big house yeah. in, yeah. in, in yeah. Vegas, but... We we do still have it, um, but we did just ball out and buy a crazy ass house in in Vegas. Um, but yeah, we still have it. So and and for that decade, did you take vacations or very limited? Very limited. So a vacation for us back then would be get in our car and drive to Yosemite. We would stay. I think one time we stayed in the park, but usually stayed out of the park because it was cheaper, and we would just hike. That was it. I mean, that that was our vacation. Um, I think one time, instead of going to Yosemite, we went to Reno and hiked there because I got some nice trails. But yeah, that was, you know, our our vacation with a daughter, with Teresa, for a week or four days would probably cost us less than 1500 bucks, all in food, gas, all of lodging, all of that. That was a big, and we did one a year, right? That was it. So they call that delayed gratification. So I think that people don't see that about you. Like now, I mean, obviously, if they follow the channel, but that's really important to be able to to put your head down and go uh, without taking that gratification. And I think many people out there, we see social media and we think, oh, you know, I, I want it today. And that's just yeah. not the case. It's it's not going to happen to 99.9% of the people. There's a, you know, that less than 1% that maybe they get lucky. Yeah. And I, and I think yeah. that was important. So w- what would you say your superpower is that got you to where you are today and i only appreciate this after the fact i had no idea this was my superpower but i think it's pretty clear it is now my ability to focus and execute on what would be seen as a boring and monotonous task to most is actually fun and exciting to me it's been 25 years or whatever it is looking at my buy box I am already excited about tomorrow's look because I just have this fundamental belief I'm one day closer to finding the next great deal. Uh, my ability, and again, I earned the nickname at work, the hammer, because I just, I just, I just keep swinging, right? I don't get, I don't get discouraged. I don't look backwards. I only look forward. Uh, I can work. I can work on what most people think is boring. And I think it's fun and exhilarating because I know where it's taking me. And um, I didn't know it, but it is without question a, super, a superpower. And I'm happy I have. I would not be here without it. I've seen people do this, you know, do what I do for a year, do what I do for two years. And then at some point, some freaking right turn happens and they start getting stupid. Like, oh, I deserve this. I deserve that. No, you haven't. You haven't done squat. What What do you mean you deserve something? You, you're not at the finish line yet. Rest when you're done. Don't rest in the middle. Yeah, it's crazy. That That's, yeah. Yeah, I think this is kind of opening my eyes to a lot of things right now, this this conversation, because I was listening to, at the gym this morning, Alex Ramosi, and he was just talking about like, hey, don't set goals. Just like, you are you should be just doing it. Do the action. Yeah. Do the action. Yeah. That should be That should be your goal is to do the action every day. And then, you know, a couple of years later, look down, look back and see what you've accomplished. Right. And, yeah. and so we set these goals and we go, oh, I'm not going to reach my goal. Well, what if I was just the daily, the daily yeah. principle of finding an off market deal or, you know, getting a deal under contract. That's like your, you know, well, here's get- the deal. Let's, let's break this down. So again, I didn't do this last year and I had a horrible year. I didn't feel like I accomplished anything. So I started reporting my weekly goals. I have, I'm, 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 I'm blindly open, right? 
Uh, last week's, my goal sucked. I missed everything. All my goals were missed. This is the sixth. I've done this for the sixth week in a row. Um, so you can go, let's do it. I have a, a complete playlist of goals. You can actually go back and watch my goals from four years ago if you want to geek out and just see how I use this. But here's the point. Alex Hermosi. So I have this quote called, do the work. You've undoubtedly heard me say it. I got swag, the whole thing. Alex Hermosi did me one better. And I saw this on Twitter. He goes, don't do the work. Do the boring work. And I'm like, that is freaking genius, right? You know how boring it is to look at your buy box 17 days in a row when nothing changes? I get it, but do it anyway, right? And, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm tracking steps. I'm talking YouTube. I mean, it's just, I, I'm exhilarated by just doing the boring work. And um, I, I don't, like, if you look at my goals tracking, I have big goals. Like, yeah, I went away, I think 185 or whatever it was. But you don't track that. You're tracking the steps and the miles run and, you know, all of these other things that you can kind of get there. So, um, yeah, track the work, track the effort, track the execution. And then, you know, you'll make daily progress, right? The whole 1% better a day thing is real. Uh, yeah, that's that's so strong. I mean, I talk to me about like I obviously you've made a lot of mistakes like the rest of us in your life. For sure. Talk to me about a painful, painful lesson in real estate investing that you learned. Maybe you overcame it and fixed it at the end. But what was like the big one or two things that you've done over your career that you were like, you know, it almost yeah. got you derailed for a minute because it was that painful in the business. Well, there's there's so many, uh, and, and they're subtle but really important. I convinced myself for somewhere between three and five years that I could figure out real estate investing by building the best spreadsheet on the planet, right? I, at one time, it had multiple tabs and all these colors and blah, 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 blah. Why? Well, that was where I was comfortable. I was comfortable with numbers. Um, I am not naturally an extrovert. I am naturally an introvert, which probably surprises a lot of people. But I, you know, you you throw me in a room, you throw me in an event, and I'm happy not talking, right? I just, I'm, I'm watch, people watching and learning and all of that. So I'm naturally an introvert. But where I'm going with this is my mistake was, and it almost derailed me, is I chose a market I never lived in. I didn't know anyone, right? My backyard was didn't work, so I had to go somewhere else. That was an arrogant and stupid decision to try to build a better mousetrap in a market that I knew no one. I should have been networking my ass off. For example, I fired my first five property managers. If I would have been networking and following up and double checking, I probably, I may have only fired the first two because I would have eventually found the right one. I had contractors steal from me. I, you know, I had contractors that uh, you know, because they were cheap or they returned my phone call first, they weren't busy. But maybe you want the contractors that are busy, right? It's just, I should have been networking day one. If I would have networked day one, you know, today, if you look at my goals, I, you should try to meet two new people a week. I didn't start that for almost five years. And I mean, we would have we would have saved money, we would have bought better deals, and we would probably be bigger. Um, it's net it's it's the people in your world, right? And you know, if you're going to go out of area, which we did, or out of state, ah, damn, network before you start throwing money down. Go find them. Go go go. Figure out who not to work with. It it it's a people business. That's that's probably the most eye opening thing when you kind of look back through history is. People can help solve problems, prevent problems, help get through problems. Um, it's not about, there's, my Excel spreadsheet today is stupid simple. I've given it away hundreds of times. How much cash in, how much cash out, produce a percentage, I'm good. It doesn't have to be. It, in fact, the more complex it is, the more, I think the more, the more problems you're creating. Real estate shouldn't be that hard. It's supposed to be income producing. So go figure out average. If you know average, go buy good or great deals. It's hard. It's never been easy. But yeah, dude, that we should have been networking day one. And it's so obvious now, it's embarrassing for me to to admit it. But that's a big one. Who who 
that that you have interviewed or maybe somebody that you follow on social are you most impressed with in the real estate investing space? Like if there's one or two people that you're like, wow, this person is amazing. Like if I could follow this person around and maybe, you know, who is that or if there is one at all? Well, I think I think we've been lucky enough to watch Dion prove that you can get done with 16 units self-management. I think mm -hmm. I think that if I if, if if we could celebrate that and make that the standard, I think that would be awesome. Uh, I do think I really consider this space kind of three steps. And I think Dion has the hardest job because Dion is dealing with drunk morons in the in the parking lot. And a lot of them are negative. A lot of them are just nasty individuals. But he's trying to get those people to look up and get in the game. My job is to get him from the stands to the field. And then the lumberjack, uh, I think he's amazing as well because he is so hands-on. And so I love how Dion and, and Matt kind of compliment me because I have no, I am not in the convincing business. I will block your ass before I will interact with somebody stupid and negative. I'll just block them. It's just better for me. Dion will interact. With them. I'm like, God, I couldn't do that. Uh, and then uh, Matt, his hands-on stuff blows me away. I have, uh, no interest in that. Thankfully, a portfolio of size where I can pay people, it's not a problem. But in the beginning, it would have saved us a lot of money if I would have understood a tenth of what that guy knows. And um, so both of those guys are right up there. Um, if I were to pick somebody that's not on my channel a lot, um, Jason, uh, what's his name? He's been on my channel a couple of times. Let me see Jason Hartman. 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 Hartman, yeah. 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 I think Hartman is interesting for a couple of things. A, he's been doing this longer than me, which I respect. B, he's really built up a company around it, which I respect. C, he does take... I like how his mind works. I respect it. Uh, he's wicked smart. I mean, he, I, mean I, I sometimes have to go look up words that he uses because I'm not sure what they mean. He's so smart. Um, I like I like Hartman. I like how he also is not afraid to engage the idiots. I've gotten to the point in, in that I just block him and move on. But but he 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 uh, interacts with them. On the non real estate front, I like the Fed guy. The Fed guy's been on my channel one time. I'm trying to get him back. He is he is. He gets credit, man. On my channel, he talked about a crash up. Like, I think it was six or nine months ago. And I got to tell you, I was like, crash up? What are you talking about? But damn, he was right. And he may be even more right in 2024. I think he's got a great handle. And um, he's a data guy, right? If the data is bad, he'll tell you it's bad. The data is good, the good, you know. A lot of these content creators and talking heads on TV, everything is negative or everything is bullish. I like the Fed guy because he's just data. Take it for what it's worth. Um, I think both Lance Lambert and Logan Matashami, Lance Lambert, Resi Club, Logan uh, Housing Wire. Uh, again, data, right? That's that's what you need in this game is, is data. Uh, I think both of them are amazing. Uh, yeah, that's those that comes off. Uh, that comes off. I guess the other one I'll shout out that's been on my channel uh, um, a little bit, but not in a, a couple of years, I think, is April Crosley to bring up a name from the past. I love how April kind of um, runs her shop, isn't afraid to speak her mind, puts it out there. Uh, she is somebody I, I really respect. I respect April. Knowing what you know now, would you have started your YouTube channel earlier in your career? Without question. With There's two things that I regret. One is I didn't take pictures of the stuff we bought as I bought them. I would love to look back at 31-year-old Mike Zuber and Olivia in front of House ABC. I would I would love to have that. We don't. And yeah, dude, I, I did a... I think I started writing a website called Wealth Building Pro. It doesn't exist anymore, but I guess it, somebody cashed it or whatever. I guess you can go find it. I should have been doing that on YouTube. 
I think that was done before YouTube existed, but man, if I could go back and just do it on video, oh, it would have been amazing. Go back and I remember the gumball house and the termite house and the roach house and all these things I were buying. Oh, it would have been great video content. And um, yeah. What about what about for you know, as you're learning the Vegas market and and doing some of that content here to like showing walkthroughs and and uh, how you're defining a buy box. Cause I, you know, I've been out here in Vegas now for full time for over four years and it's an interesting market. I haven't figured it out really. I mean, I, you know, I, I watch zip codes, I'm always looking and it's, it's a hard market. It seems very difficult yeah. to really figure out. Yeah. So I'm curious to watch as you start, you know, figuring out what zip codes you're going to buy in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of, the housing stock yeah. you're going to, you're going to go towards. It sounds like now you're kind of looking for more newer inventories. So you don't have the same issues and turnover, but it'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. And I think if you documented that would be really cool. Cause my, you, you my know, full intention is to document the whole thing right back. And it's going to start hopefully after the event where I start talking to agents. Cause again, I'm going to go back and do this. Like I was a rookie. And the first thing you have to do is you have to go talk to a lot of people. You know, we're talking dozens and say where to buy, where not to buy. Who should I talk to? Who should I not talk to? And you're going to watch me, assuming the agents say yes, which I can't imagine they wouldn't. You're going to watch me uncover my buy box. It'll probably take six months. Then you're going to uncover me setting up my buy box, buy box criteria. Then you're going to watch me write offers or learn average or whatever. Yeah, I, I plan to document as much as possible. Yeah, that, that'll be... That'll be sweet. I think that that's what people would love to see uh, on your channel. Um, so do you have any other books in the, in the pipeline? It's funny you bring that up. Um, and I, I, hopefully I can say this. So one of the things that I'm thinking about doing is creating an umbrella brand or media or publishing company or whatever you want to call it, just call it or at right. One rental at a time. And I want to seek out other folks who have stories that I know, respect, and love. Because one rental at a time, if you really break down the book, it's really a template of how other books could be written. So just, again, I don't hide anything. I reached out to Dion and said, hey, Dion, what would you think about taking one rental at a time as a framework and writing your story? And we'll do it together. It'll be jointly published. I'll add my, you know, my parts. And then again, if you break down one rental at a time, it's 60% your story and then 40%, you know, lessons learned or what makes you unique or, or whatever. So I would, uh, I'm actively playing with an idea. I don't know what it takes to make a media company. I have no idea. Uh, I don't know what it takes to just do a publishing deal with someone else. No idea. But I would love, I would love in the next, I would love to write one book a year, other people's stories. And um, yeah, so I, I think at this point, I want to document other people's stories. And I think everybody has a story to tell. I think that's one thing that not enough people appreciate is everybody, you know, everybody's got a story. I think everybody has a book in them. And I hope I want to help pull that out in as many people that I respect. So uh, I did. I reached out to Dion. I also sent a text to Matt now that he's retired. <laughs> so hopefully... My my uh, I would love to write a book with half the millionaires that come on my channel. I think that'd be a blast. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, the guy that's coming to your event with me is actually he he's an internet marketer, but he's he's self published a few books. He he so nice. he can pick his brain. So it's yeah. I mean nowadays it's easy to do. You know, it's the hard part is getting down. It's getting somebody to sit down and write. Yeah. The con you know the content and and putting that together. Um, let's talk about. Um, Take me back to a time where you actually like maybe looked up from your, you know, your grind and delayed gratification, whether it was a flip and you got a big check or it was a cash flow statement from your property manager. Take yeah. me back to a time where you finally, where, where you, where you like kind of took a breath and you said, you know what? <laughs> I can't believe I made, I've done this or we, not you. It was yeah, we. Yeah. It was we, we for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, what was I, that time? I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I was out of the country. I was either in Europe or Australia, one of those English speaking countries. And um, I think it was Australia because I remember the time zone being, I think it was night for me and morning for Olivia. 
And this had to be in 2011 or 12. And, you know, we're checking in doing, you know, how you doing, how's Teresa, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then we switched to the to the business. And I said, uh, hey, we just we just closed on XYZ property. Uh, I see that we're due, you know, we just finished the maintenance. It's now leased. How much money do I need to move over? Because uh, again, we keep all our bank accounts, you know, separate. And um, my expectation from her is we needed, I don't know, 14 grand or 12 grand or some number to basically make up that bill. And I still remember it when she said, oh, we don't need anything. And I'm like, what? Because this had been going on for, you know, years, right? And she was like, uh, no, the cash flow covers it. I'm like, cash flow? She goes, yeah, Michael. Because again, she ran the books. I found deals. We were very, you know, peanut butter and jelly, right? She did her thing. I did mine. And she's like, no, Michael, do you have any idea what we collect a month? And, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm like, no, <laughs> I have no idea. That's your job, honey. <laughs> and uh, she's like, yeah, no, we're good. And I'm like, wow, that was such a great feeling. And then uh, fast forward, the other time it happened is uh, when Olivia said she wanted to retire. She retired first. And uh, I remember talking to her. I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's take your paycheck and have it go to this other account. And let's see if we can live on cash flow. And yeah, six or nine months later, we never touched her cash. She retired and, and she was uh, she was really happy. So yeah, it, um, it it happened a couple of times. And again, to your point, I had, I had never even considered it, dude. I was always next deal, next deal, next deal. And uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that conversation because it does prove it can work. And, and so that kind of brings up another question. You guys did very well as a team. And it sounds like your role was like finding the deal, putting it together. And then Olivia was like, she just strong back, you know, like mm -hmm. office, like admin, mm -hmm. bookkeeping, strategy. Is that how you guys ran the business all this time, pretty much? Or has it changed? Yeah, pretty much. No. Um, so while we were both employed, Absolutely. I found deals and secured capital. She ran, she ran the day-to-day. -day. She did the check-ins, the follow-ups, the approvals, all that stuff. When she retired, um, there was a couple of years where she was a part of the buying process. Um, but we really started buying slower and slower and slower. So she kind of backed out of that the last couple of years. Um, I've always been the next deal, right? I can't stand the books, right? I look at it once a year when we do our taxes. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely, we definitely are comfortable in our areas and we respect each other. One of the things I could, I, I think is really important is my deal. My job was to find deals and secure capital, but Olivia had a veto, right? She could always veto any deal. And it, and the, the important thing about her veto is she didn't have to tell me why she could just say, Hey, there's something about it. I don't like done. And, you know, of course, I would ask questions, but her veto helped, right? There were several deals that I was ecstatic about that she vetoed for whatever reason. And, um, I, you know, that's an important thing because, again, we were always doing this together. Uh, so, I, you know, I shouldn't strong arm her into something she wasn't comfortable with. It, it hurt in the moment, but I think each time she was right in hindsight, but uh, it certainly hurt in the moment. So during this whole time, you didn't, you ultimately had a, a good business relationship like there was never times where you guys were at each other's throats pretty it was not always only, pretty not, 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 yeah pretty peaceful um i think even more important was there were several times where i was down and she was up like i talked about that first house on north drive right i was ready to give up uh, i talked about that time pulling over because i was crying after going to a housewarming party she was up and there were times where she was down, like she was running the books. It was like, oh my God, you know, we need six grand for this or that, or this AC broke, or, you know, she had her bad days as well. And I was like, it's okay, honey, we got this. We're, you know, one step at a time. That's why we have a reserve account. We'll just fill up the reserve account and, you know, we'll wait a couple of months until my stock vests or whatever. And, you know, it'll, everything will work out. So um, I don't remember a time where we were both negative. 
I remember plenty of times where one of us was negative and the other one listened, was respectful, but really got us to the other side. Because this, this is hard, man. 10 years of sacrifice, uh, buying through before, during, and after the Great Recession, getting taken advantage of left, right, and center multiple times, having, you know, yeah, it's just, it's it's tough. It's it's a it's it's this whole you know passive income nonsense. It's not passive. It might be semi passive. Uh, certainly during the build process, it's not passive. You may make it more passive when you get done, but uh, during the during the acquisition or the build time, man, it's not passive. What's you 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 do a lot of great like inspirational things for your viewers where you're going to give them the cards and so forth. What's been one or two really uh, uh, reach outs you've gotten from people that have taken action and had some success that like really impacted you the most so far through YouTube? I love it. So the, the, the beauty about being on YouTube now five or six years is I get daily notes really almost every day now about thanking you, keep it going, you're changing my life, all of that. The ones that really resonate to me is when parents talk about their kids. Because that's generational. If you go back to my very, very, very first video where I'm on my couch in my purple polo shirt, um, my goal hasn't changed. I'm trying to put something out there that will outlive me by 50 years. And where I said the way to accomplish this is not me helping Bo, but it will be me helping Bo's kids. That's how I live 50 years after my death is by impacting your kid. And those are the notes that mean the most, right? My kid's watching this with me. My kid asked me about this. Um, you know, my kid is already saving for a down payment. My kid started a YouTube channel because of you. Um, there's, when I hear a story about a parent who thanks me because I positively impacted their kid, there's nothing better, just nothing better. Yeah, that's amazing. That was one of the questions I was going to ask is like, fast forward 50 years, 50, 60 years, 70 years, depending on with technology, but you're in your deathbed on your deathbed. Yep. And you know, like, what do you want to be remembered for? And you basically just answered the question. So I don't have to ask you that again. Uh, but let's talk. Let's do that. Um, so one of the things. So I think Gary V talks about this, right? Go to old folks home and talk to them and see what they want to talk about. Everybody talks about their regrets. Uh, Olivia and I have been pretty clear, been lucky enough to take some crazy vacations, right? We did a month in Asia, three weeks in Europe, and we're doing five, six star vacations. So what does that mean? We're, we're around very wealthy, generally speaking, older people. We're usually in the bottom 10% of age, right? We're in our fifties. We're, we're, usually interacting with people in their 70s or 80s. And when you're on these trips, there's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of people sharing their story. And dude, even on like the last the last ship we were on, um, I think there were less than 200 people on the entire boat. It's like 170. So freaking crazy, crazy boat. And my guess is the average net worth of the people on the cruise had to be north of 10 million bucks, the average. Several hundred millionaires and above. But we were talking to folks and blah, blah, blah. And by the third day, everybody knows what everybody does, right? And, and Olivia and I were the real estate people. So like by the day six or seven, where, where people are coming to us and telling us their stories. Some of them were of regret. Like, I shouldn't have sold that. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I remember one couple, um, we actually had dinner with them a couple of nights in a row. Uh, they were buying stuff in the 70s in New York. And I think they owned like 330 units in New York, like Manhattan. <laughs> and they're depreciated to zero. They've got no debt on them, all of these things. And we were just talking about, because again, right, New York's New York in the 70s and 80s wasn't great. Right. The, you know, the murder capital of the world or whatever in the 80s because of all the drugs. But they told all kinds of stories and just all just, you know, 
police raids and all of these things. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the ending of the story was we wouldn't do it any other way. You know, they're, they're, this particular couple takes six months a year to travel on just ridiculous vacations, all because they built a portfolio and never sold. They never sold a thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really important. And, and I want people to think about this. What do you want to do in 10 years? Because if you're not taking action on them, it's not going to magically happen. In regret, the pain of regret, I've seen it on people's faces. It's just, you don't want any of that. So what do you want? Like, really, what do you want? Well, then work on it every day. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, it's as I'm, we're unpacking your story a little bit, I'm thinking about like your YouTube channel. And I'm, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking hammer, hammer, hammer. Yeah. Here's a, yeah. here's a guy that, here's a guy that has 13,000 uploads. He's doing exactly what he did in real estate with his YouTube channel. And now I'm watching you get on with Graham Stefan and, um, you know, Sean Canel, Cano, I can never say his name, right? Canel, um, yeah. um, you're, you're getting all these huge Ryan Pineda show, blowing it up, getting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views. Your shows, your channel is blowing up like with loyal, loyal followers. And I'm just thinking like you're doing exactly what you've done your whole life. You're the hammer when it comes to YouTube. Yes. Um, and from like from a strategy standpoint, and I'm taking that because I have a small YouTube channel. I'm like, OK, I'm, I got to be that. I got to be the junior hammer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's nothing. Nothing I do is complex. And again, I, I think we said this earlier. My superpower is I thoroughly enjoy being the hammer. Like, I look forward to this video going up. I look, I look forward to my nine o'clock hub call. I look forward to my nine thirty with Brian Anderson. Right? It's just, it's just how my, just, I'm wired to enjoy what others would think is monotonous, and it is without a doubt a superpower. And I don't get the other thing is I'm not I I am not interested in perfection, not interested at all. I'm interested in execution. I know with enough execution, I will get better. I have no interest in editing videos and B-roll and all this nonsense. I want to just focus on creating good content that people like and outlives me by 50 years. I, I will never be the biggest channel. I refuse to go negative. I will share bad things when they happen, but I'm not going to go negative. If you want to grow on YouTube, be negative. If you want to have impact, if you want to change people's lives 50 years after you're dead, you can't go negative. And the last thing I'll say in that is, can you imagine living in a doom loop every day? It would be exhausting. You would be a miserable person to be around. So I just block that nonsense. And I think more people need to block. The, what I don't think people appreciate about social media is we like to bitch about it. But I work in the Valley. I know these engineers. I know people working on these algorithms. They're just... They're just feeding you what you cook on. Their job is to give you more of what you like. So if you like positive, block doomers. Like if you look at my Twitter, which is the most negative platform on the planet, it's extremely positive. You want to look at Instagram? Completely positive. YouTube? Completely positive. Every once in a while, a doomer will sneak in. I will simply pull up my phone and block them. I have no interest in adding poison to my mind. It's already hard enough. I don't need neg I don't need to allow negativity. But but with YouTube, I mean there is a component of strategy, right? We're going to the there is you know some thought that has to go in. I mean obviously you haven't done much other than bringing I mean you've done a lot, but my point is is you're not doing any smoke and mirrors, editing, thumbnails. People are coming back cuz they like the content. It resonates with them. They're learning, they're engaging. They like the characters that come on and educate and, you know, share their wins or losses. But also to get the Graham Steffens, to get the big names, like, you know, people want some of that, right? We want to hear from some of those people because what we like about it is that you're real. So if you're talking to them, we know, hey, he's a normal guy and he's not, yeah. this isn't fluff. He's going to ask good questions. So yeah. who who's on your hit list to get on the show? That's, Oh, you know, I, I would love some help with this. So my dream guest, this is going to really shock most people. 
I would love to interview Pitbull. A, uh, it's the only concert I've been to a couple of times. I just, I, I like it. I actually sat front row in Vegas one time. So I'd love to interview Pitbull. And if you've ever seen Pitbull get interviewed, he is wicked smart. I would love to interview Pitbull. Also, when I got my channel started, I wanted to interview Gary V. Right, Gary V. talks about being the hammer, basically, and you know, don't talk to me until you have you know a hundred uploads. Well, well, Gary, I've got thirteen thousand. Is that enough? Right. Let's let's talk. Um, I would like to interview uh, Grant Cardone. Um, I want to talk about the single family. Uh, I want to talk. I want to talk about the grind um, because I think he has a story there that that is underappreciated because he's such so bodacious. He's so flashy. I want to unpack. I want to, un like you're doing for me, I want to unpack Grant in the moment. Like, I want to go back to that first house. I want to go back to him being scared and, and writing 10X. I want to, I want to, I want to impact some of that. Because it's, I think, I think a lot of people look at folks like Grant and all they see is the, the wins, I guarantee you there are plenty of losses and pain and struggle. Uh, I want to unpack some of that because I think I think more people need to realize, like in my world, from where I sit, Grant Cardone is, there's no secret there. He creates, he, he got really good at selling cars. Then he realized that niche was too small. Then he went wider. Then he started monetizing on YouTube and then he started doing events. He wrote some great books. I think 10X is a great book. Then um, because his his reputation grew, he started raising capital. And it it makes it makes perfect logical sense. And I want to go back to those moments. Uh, he just did a 90 minute with Ryan Pineda. I just finished yesterday. I thought it was pretty good. It was it was the most self in like like self review i've seen grant do i i think right now grant's changing i don't think a lot of people realize that but grant two years ago was all flash i think he's i think he's evolving right now i think he's shedding his skin and trying to become something different and and better right i think he wants to become blackstone so let, let's see what that looks like i think i think it's i think there's some people yeah and uh Ben Mala, I think, would be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, th those are some of the big names I'd love to. But yeah, Pitbull, I think, would surprise a lot. Of, I'd love to interview Pitbull. I would fly anywhere to go interview that guy. Pitbull would be amazing. We got to make that happen. <laughs> All right, year. folks, reach out to Pitbull. I want to interview Pitbull. It, uh, yeah, no, I was watching your interview of uh, Ryan Pineda when he was talking about his, some of his losses. And I love that because... Uh, one is I got a new another more appreciation for Ryan because I, I like when people say, hey, look, I'm not always winning. I lose a lot, too. And like I think people need to realize that even these guys that are doing really well, like if you watch Ryan Pineda over the last like four years or five years, it's like amazing to see how he's done in social media. Right. Like um, so that was a great, great episode. I really enjoyed that because it was like, OK, here the guy's being transparent. He's he's human. Right. Like he's blown yeah. up. But like. You know, he got he his. Lost, he booty. lost seven figures. He had to yeah. sell assets to make up the debt. He sold businesses. Talked about having hard conversations with his wife. Folks, this stuff's hard, and I really respect Ryan for for putting that out there. So, so good on him. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I like when I see these the the up and comers and and the the people that have are blown up like David Green, for example. <laughs> I did his. He had a couple houses when I like a rental properties, but I think I did his first hard money loan for him in discovery <laughs> Bay when he bought a flip. And it's like, it's so funny to see this guy now he's yeah. got books, he's got this huge, you know, following. Uh, but it also goes to show you that you, you know, putting yourself out there can also re you can reap the rewards. I like how you're telling people like, look, if, if you're passionate, you know, share it on YouTube, right? Like you never yeah. know that could be, that could be a huge revenue share. I mean, I've made, I make most of my business comes from my YouTube channel now, right? And like guesting on other people. So I get, you know, leads that way. Because really I share a message. Hey, I can help the world, right? Right. I can either help well, I, you or I can't help. I am so thankful. Because one of the things that I'm trying to make one rental at a time is I'm, I'm, I don't want to be the guy that says real estate's the only way. 
it's not the only way. We all know that, but I don't want to be that guy. So the fact that you said yes to coming back every Wednesday um, to, to have that conversation and, and to be the concierge to small business lending is amazing. Because I think I think for a lot of people, real estate's not the way, but maybe buying a business is. Uh, maybe buying a franchise is. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I want to enable anybody, because again, you can get wealthy in stocks. You can get wealthy in real estate. You can get wealthy in a business. Um, you can get, you can build a brand on YouTube. Um, I just want people to, to realize the power. And again, to your earlier question, I should have started this while I had a full-time job. Now, I would not have been doing three videos a day, but I could have done three a week, right? And just... People love the come up and um, yeah, I, I'm so glad you're on YouTube and, and growing. I, I've seen what you do for my audience. Um, just, just keep going, man. Just, just keep going. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking that would be cool. Like another, you can have another channel for the, the young, younger generation, the, these, and have mm -hmm. somebody, you know, co-host the show with you. That's in early twenties. Maybe they're doing, you know, they're on their I'd love that. There's, they got two or three rental properties. They're early twenties, and they're out there kind of spreading the word word to the young generation. Look, start with a house hack, buy that yeah. duplex with FHA, live in one side, do a two hundred three k loan like me, Kevin did back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I think this needs to. We need to spread the word because a, a lot yeah. of people that get out of the university and they have a couple hundred thousand dollars of student, de yeah. you know, student loans, and and they don't really have a calling, right? Well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe going to trade school to become a plumber or an yeah. uh, HVAC technician, then you own a business and you're making multiple millions of dollars in top line revenue is yeah. a better option in investing in real estate. I think people yeah. need a little bit more help in, in yeah. kind of, I would, I, their, you know, yeah. I would love to, you know, create a playlist or another channel, whatever the right answer is for that. The other thing I want to go back to is I, I'm really, I want to get, I want to get loud on this. I'm generation X. You're Gen X. I want Gen X and baby boomers to hear this. You likely have a passion or a hobby that you have had for decades. Trust me when I say there is a tribe or a community waiting for you to create your channel. Now, you will never be the biggest. But once you find your tribe, you will have so much fun. When you're authentic and you talk about your thing, Star Wars, Pokemon, Cabbage Patch Kids, Care Bears, whatever the heck it is for our youth, there's a tribe there waiting for you. And then, oh, by the way, you will eventually get monetized. You could write a book. You could do all these other things, and you will be happy. I believe a lot of the younger folks, Gen Z and millennials, they create YouTube channels to make money. And then they get disappointed when they're not making money in seven days. If you're Gen X or baby boomer, you're probably not motivated by AdSense, which is awesome, which means you could build the right way. You could build slowly. You can find your voice. You can find other guests to come back weekly like you do on my channel. It's just an easy recipe when you don't have to chase pennies. Now, pennies will come. Those pennies will turn to dollars and if you do it long enough, you'll have a seven, like one rental ad. I had somebody offer me a million dollars. I think this was seven, maybe nine months ago for the brand one rental at a time for the trademark, for my books, a million bucks to buy it off me. Now I'm not selling, but it was flattering to get that offer, but it, it can become something. So um, yeah, it's, it's, I wish more boomers and Gen X who don't need the pennies would go, you know what? I'm going to create a channel around X and it'll be slow and it'll be hard, but trust me, you're going to be five years older in five years. Might as well have something that, you know, you're proud of. So that, that's a, an ask. So start one. So uh, we're, we're coming up on the hour pretty quick here. We've got this Saturday is the kickoff for the event. I think there's, yeah. So many people flying into town. There's so many people excited. Uh, this is going to be an amazing event. I think Friday for anybody that's coming in early, 
They can go to uh, Ryan Pineda's if there's still space. They have to go to the yep. Eventbrite link. What are we going to do on Friday? Walk us through the the Friday kind of whoever's in town networking, and then yeah. So we're gonna we're right. So Ryan Pineda and I caught up like a week ago now, maybe eight days ago, because I, I I I'm like I'm reaching out to all the people I know in Vegas, saying, hey, if you want to come through, meet 300 amazing people. Um, I'll, I'll put you on the VIP list, right? Just come through. Tell me what time you're coming. Come on through. And Ryan basically said, I'd love to, but I don't do like weekends or family time. I'm like, cool. No big, like I'm expecting most people to tell me no. So perfectly fine answer. But then he comes back and goes, you know what? Why don't we host something at my office? And I'm like, I'm down. What are you thinking? And he's like, we'll clear it out. We'll, we'll first was a hundred people. Now it's 200 people. We'll just host an event from 4 to 6 p.m. So that it was no grand plan. It was no end of this, but now we're hosting an event. So, uh, you know, we're going to have a chance to network with, you know, one rental at a time and local folks. Um, we, we're going to obviously answer questions. No pitching. Um, you know, a lot of everything I do is always about the audience. So it'll be audience driven for sure. I'm sure Ryan will and I will both say five to 10 minutes about something, but hopefully it's just live q and I, I would love that. So. Shout out Ryan for offering. He didn't have to. Um, so thank you. Uh, but yeah, so that will be Friday. And then Saturday, I am, um, yeah, Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. It's just going to be awesome. I hope, I hope, I hope people tag me on all the Instagram pictures and posts one rental at a time. It is, um, it's been a long time coming. This is my hope. Obviously, I hope everybody has a good time. It's memorable. Life, I hope it's life-changing for every audience member. I hope a couple of things happen. One, when we close Sunday, I plan to ask, now I may forget, but I plan to ask, who wants to do this next year, President's Day weekend? My hope is most people say yes, and I book the room, I book the building right then. Because it, it's like 10 grand just to book the place. So I hope to I hope to write another 10K check to book it in a year. Second, I really think we could do, and this is what I want to talk to you about, is I think we could do an event once a quarter on different things. Like President's Day weekend every year is a celebration. But maybe in the summer, we do a small business thing. Maybe, you know, in the fall, we do a YouTube thing. I don't know. I'm just playing with all these things. But um, I, I just, I, I hope to get such a high that I could look for. Because again, doing an event, I don't have a team, dude. I got no VAs. I got none of this stuff. So this thing's all me, which means it's either all my fault or all my win. But um, it's not easy and uh, not cheap. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I hope the event Saturday and Sunday is life changing, and we just do more of them. I really do. I, I think I. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, it's going to be amazing, and 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 I think there's still a couple spots. If somebody wanted to watch it from their home, they can get the streaming. Yeah, the virtual the virtual event is there. I'm going to turn that off probably Wednesday, um, because I just everything that comes in I have to deal with. So I'm probably going to turn off the registration Wednesday, so it's just like one less thing to worry about. Um, but yeah, it's um there's still some seats. It's 99 bucks. It's stupid cheap. Uh, yeah, stupid cheap. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, this has been an awesome interview. We we talked about a lot. I, I I'm pretty inspired. I have to say that in the back of my mind, I keep on saying hammer. That's like my <laughs> wake up and just think hammer. I'm a I'm a I'm a hammer. There you go. And the, the funny thing is, my nickname is I'm Jewish. The, my best friend, one of my best friends, Eric, he calls me the Hebrew hammer because I used <laughs> to do go. I used to do MMA. So. But now I'm going to be the hammer in business. And it's there really just getting getting joy out yeah. of the, you know. Joy from doing. Yep. Joy from doing. Oh, I got to do this. But, you know, once in a while you uncover that three-bedroom, two-bath yeah. house that's yep. 70, 70, 60 cents on the dollar. And you can exactly. make some money on it. And that's super exciting. So thank you so much for letting me interview you. This was amazing. Awesome. And, uh, well, what is your channel? Yeah. So my channel is called Investor Financing Podcast. And so, yeah, and we talk about all things financing. I started talking about 
DSER and fix and flip, but I really grew my passion over the last couple of years into SBA financing. So I mostly talk about how to finance businesses and and we bring on entrepreneurs and so forth. And then I just launched another podcast called Own a Business Today mm -hmm. podcast. Uh, and that's nice. more geared interviewing franchisors and people doing business acquisitions. Awesome. And if somebody wanted to book a 15 minute call with you for my channel, how do they do that? Go to one rental meeting.com one rental meeting.com you can always go there and you can uh book time with me that's the best way guys go to one rental meeting.com yeah. yep and he bought that url just for our audience one rental meeting.com don't forget he will be at the event saturday and sunday bring your questions take your pictures tag me on instagram thanks Bob. all right thank you